speak <coughs> in a kind of introductory way about the Srimad Bhagavatam uh, in light of your upcoming Bhakti by Baba studies. So I thought we should start by discussing the importance of the Srimad Bhagavatam. And the importance of the Bhagavatam is declared by the Bhagavatam itself in the very beginning, Canto 1, Chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 in particularly. Of course, there are many other verses that declare the importance of the Bhagavatam, but we can get a very, very clear and concise understanding of this importance if we examine the first three verses. So, <clears throat> the first verse of the Srimad Bhagavatam begins with the invocation, Om Namo Bhagavati Vasudevaya. So, I would like to ask from you learned devotees, if you could tell me what is the significance of this, Om Namo Bhagavati Vasudevaya, what is being declared here by the Srimad Bhagavatam. Please tell me. Yes. Yes. truth is the Bhagavan Yes. So this is the very first opening statement of the Bhagavatam. It is identifying who is Bhagavan. And it is also identifying our relationship with Bhagavan. Om Namo uh, Namaha means we must offer our respectful obeisances. Uh, Bhagavate to Sri Bhagavan Vasudev or Krishna. <coughs> and then the Bhagavatam next declares Janmadhyasya Yaktaha. So I would also like to hear some thoughts on this. What is the significance of this? Yes. Um, everything is emanating from the absolute truth. Everything that is true. That is correct, but perhaps you could uh, mention the name of another scripture where this same phrase is found. Vedanta Yes, Vedanta Sutra. So what is important about this is that Janmadya Syaryataha is uh, the phrase, the sutra, the code, that Vedanta Sutra uses to uh, define Brahman, the Absolute Truth. Brahman is defined as that from which everything comes. That's the meaning of Janma Dhyasya Yataha, the source of everything. So Bhagavatam immediately states that the Supreme Bhagavan, Supreme Godhead, personality of Godhead, is Vasudev Sri Krishna, and that this Vasudev Sri Krishna is the Brahman that is the subject matter of the Danta Sutra. So from this right here, we are able to see that the Srimad Bhagavatam is the natural commentary of the Danta Sutra. So this is very, very significant. We're, uh, we're talking about the importance of Srimad Bhagavatam. So, this is one of the great glories of the Srimad Bhagavatam. That it is Srila Vyasadeva's own natural commentary upon the Vedanta Sutra. And the Vedanta Sutra is the apex of the Vedanta literature. Vedanta means Upanishads. And the Upanishads are the philosophical commentary on the four Vedas. And the different Upanishads, there are 108 Upanishads. So they are assigned to the different four Vedas. And the intention of the Upanishads is to explain philosophically what the Vedas are about. But of course, the Upanishads are very, very, very... They're meant for, for great sages, actually. So Upanishads are very, very difficult for Kaliuga entities to understand. <laughs> And uh, this is ironically why the Mayavadis like the Upanishads, because <laughs> they can get away with so much speculation. Because uh, 
the language of the Upanishads is, is difficult. And even the tikas, the basyas, written by great <coughs> acharyas, that is also different, not easy to comprehend. So then the Upanishads are codified in Vedanta Sutra by Vyasadeva himself. But that is also very difficult to understand because Sutra means code. So it's hard to penetrate a code of just a few words. Sometimes these sutras of Vedanta are only one word, simply one word. And yet it has so much meaning. But what is that meaning? It is difficult. Of course, the Acharyas have written uh, their basyas on Vedanta Sutra. Uh, but Srila Vyasadeva has written his own natural commentary, and that is Srimad Bhagavatam. So what could be a better explanation than that commentary that is provided by the self-same author of the Vedanta Sutra, of the Upanishads, of the Vedas? Srila Vyasadeva. So, then we find in this first verse also the line Tini Brahma Krida Ya Odi Kovaye. So I would like to hear if you have any thoughts about that line. Yes? So Lord Krishna who first departed to make knowledge into the heart of Brahma Sita or it's not in me. Yes, exactly. So who is Brahma? Creator of the universe. Yes. He is, but why is he uh, addressed as Adi Kavi? He's the first one to have this Vedic knowledge from Krishna. Yeah, Kavi, Kavi uh, means learned personality. Kavi means poet, but uh, a very, very most learned personality who speaks in uh, poetic ways. So, Brahma is the Adi Kavi, the original speaker of the Vedas. So there can be no uh, higher authority in this universe as to what the Veda is, what Vedanta means, than Brahma. Uh, he is the giver of the Vedic knowledge and he has fully realized the Vedic knowledge within his heart. And uh, he has realized uh, the uh, tattva, the truth of the Vedas, as Sri Krishna himself, as this self-same Bhagavan Vasudev, was being addressed in the first verse of Srimad Bhagavatam. So it is by Lord Krishna's grace that um, Brahma is the uh, giver of Vedic knowledge. Krishna has uh, revealed that knowledge within Brahma's heart. Brahma is the first of the Brahmanas. So the Brahmanas, um, they are supposed to be the protectors, the teachers of Vedic knowledge. They are uh, the authoritative class from which we should hear Veda. So Brahma is the first of the Brahmanas. All the other Brahmanas receive knowledge from him by way of Parampara. So, uh, Brahma, his position as the greatest sage of the Vedas is established by Lord Krishna himself. Then, Muyanti Yat Surya, what does that mean? Hmm? Yes. That even the great demigods, they are not, they don't understand the absolute truth. Yes, Surya means demigods and also sages. Now the significance of this statement in the beginning of Bhagavatam is expanded in the sixth canto of the Bhagavatam with that verse uh, uh, Dharmam tu shakshat bhagavat pranitam uh, na vai vidu rishya na devaha So rishis and devas, sages and demigods are mentioned. That uh, uh, what is dharma? What is the a proper path of spiritual progress. It is that which is taught by Bhagavan. Tamam tu shakshat bhagavat pranitam. And otherwise, apart from Bhagavan, even the great sages and even devatas, they do not know. They do not know what is Dharma. Separately from what the Supreme Lord has taught. 
neither do the sinners know, and neither do the asuras, the great demons, they also do not know, nor the human beings, nor the uh, 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 chadanas and vidyadharas, these are heavenly type uh, entities. So uh, none of these, they're great personalities, no doubt. But apart from what Krishna is giving, there is no proper understanding of Dharma. And this is important to file away the, the meaning of this Muyanti at Surya uh, when we come to the second verse of Srimad Bhagavatam. So this is being established here that it is Krishna alone who is giving Dharma, real Dharma. And uh, we should uh, receive Dharma only from one who is repeating what Krishna has taught without adding something or subtracting something. Satyam param dhimi. Would someone like to say something about that? Satyam param dhimi. The verse 1 of Bhagavatam ends with this phrase. Yes? I meditate upon the actual truth. Yes, so the satyam param, the supreme absolute truth, is this self-same Bhagavan Vasudev. So, this is important. Prabhupada, in his uh, purport to this verse, is speaking, he's mentioning how there's uh, sometimes a difference is raised between uh, the uh, Supreme Lord and the Absolute Truth. Ishwara and Brahman or Paramsatya. The Mayavadis do this. The Mayavadis say, yes, Ishwara, the Lord, uh, Narayan, Vasudev, Krishna. Yes, he is an incarnation of the Sattva Guna, the mood of goodness. And therefore, because he is the purest of the pure goodness, therefore he has authority all over, uh, over the whole material nature. He is at the apex of material nature, at the pinnacle, the pinpoint top of material nature, that entity, Narayan, Vasudev, Krishna. And because he's the purest, so he has authority over everything below. The rest of Sattva Guna, Raja Guna, Tamu Guna. But <coughs> that Ishwara, that controller of material nature, is not the Param Satyam, is not the Supreme Truth, is not Brahman. Because Brahman is near Guna, then, then they go into their philosophy. Brahman is not touched by any modes of nature, Brahman is all one and Brahman is impersonal, Nirakar, uh, Anama has no name, uh, Arupa, no form, they go into their nonsense. <laughs> so they, they try to argue this by saying there's a difference between Ishwara. Ishwara is still a material entity, um, but the absolute truth that is a spiritual and impersonal. So this is refuted in the first verse of the Srimad Bhagavatam. This, this is very significant. That right off the bat, verse number one, Bhagavatam is giving a mighty kick in the face of the Mayavadi philosophy. Because Bhagavatam is saying, Bhagavan Vasudev, the Supreme Lord, Ishwara Parama Krishna, is the Param Satyam, is the Supreme Absolute Truth, is that Brahman which is Janma Dhyasya the source of everything. So this, this artificial distinction of the Mayavadis is removed. And Dimihi, Prabhupada explains, uh, Dimihi is in the Gayatri Mantra. Uh, the, uh, those who are initiated into Gayatri, they meditate on the Absolute Truth by chanting this mantra. So first verse of Bhagavatam is declaring that that Absolute Truth, uh, that the uh, Brahmanas who chant Gayatri are meditating upon, that is actually Krishna. So now remembering what we said about uh, Muyanti, Yatsureya, uh, even the great sages and demigods are bewildered as to what is the absolute truth, unless they have the mercy of Krishna. And then we go to verse number two, which begins, Dharma Projita Kaitava Atra, that the Srimad Bhagavatam is 
as Prabhupada used to say, kicking out, kicking out kaitava dharma. Kaitava dharma means a cheating dharma. It means religious principles which do not come up to the standard of Srimad Bhagavatam of identifying uh, Bhagavan as Vasudev, as identifying this Vasudev Krishna as uh, the source of everything, as the supreme absolute truth. Any uh, uh, dharma, religious principle that does not come to this is considered by the Srimad Bhagavatam to be kaitava, cheating, misleading. It misleads people and therefore it is rejected in the pages of Srimad Bhagavatam. So Prabhupada in explaining this, this line, Dharma Projita Kaitava Atra, in a lecture in 1968, he cited Srila Sridhar Maharaj, who is the uh, first commentator on the Srimad Bhagavatam. And Srila Sridhar Maharaj has written in this connection, Atra Moksha, Mokshati Sandhi, Api Nirastam, which means that the Srimad Bhagavatam is bringing one beyond liberation. So that means that, you see, there is this conventional Chatur Bharg. This is the fourfold uh, duty of the human being, which is taught in the Vedic scriptures. It's called Chatur Bharg, four stages of development of human life. And the first is Dharma. And Dharma generally means, uh, as it does today in India, this term Dharma is, is very much associated with uh, uh, proper married life. That uh, men and women should be married and should conduct their household affairs as per the injunctions of scripture. This is, this is generally how Dharma is understood. And then as a result of, or coming natural, naturally following uh, that, Arta, economic development, there must be economic development, otherwise uh, then marriage life becomes very difficult. And then once uh, there is some uh, economic development, some, some wealth is there, house, land, etc., then there can be calm, uh, sense gratification by which children are produced because now you have money to support the children and then at the end moksha liberation this is the fourth stage so what Srila Sridhar Maharaj is saying in effect is that dharma that extends only up to moksha is not sufficient that also comes under this heading kaitava dharma misleading dharma and the Bhagavatam rejects that. The Bhagavatam goes beyond. The, don't, we should not misunderstand that, that the Bhagavatam is severing itself from Dharma art to common motion. No, but uh, the fifth stage, and what is the fifth stage? Who can tell me? Yes? Prema. Prema. <laughs> Very good. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has declared the fifth stage, Prabhupada calls it the fifth dimension of spiritual life is Prema Pumarto Mahan or the uh, Purusharta Shirumani. Shirumani means the crown jewel. And the Purusharta, another way of, of, of summing up this Chaturvarga, these four stages, is to call it the Purusharta. The four, Arta means goals. So the four goals of Purusha, the human being. So Purusharta, Shiromani, the crown jewel on top of those four goals is love of Krishna. So yes, it is not that Bhagavatam is uh, severing itself from the four previous stages. Uh, but Bhagavatam is saying unless those, those four are crowned with the method of love of Godhead, method to develop love of Krishna, then they are kaitava and they are misleading and they are to be rejected. So this is, this is what, what is coming out of this then is the notion of 
Bhagavat Dharma. But there is a Dharma called Bhagavat Dharma, which is taught by the Srimad Bhagavatam. And this is the pure Dharma. This is the actual Dharma, the actual intention of Srila Vyasadeva throughout all the Vedic scriptures is to establish this Bhagavat Dharma. Uh, but uh, as we shall see uh, in study, our study of the Srimad Bhagavatam, particularly uh, Narada Muni's instructions on Srimad Bhagavatam, that uh, uh, the Srimad Bhagavatam is the one scripture uh, which is focusing on this Bhagavad Dharma as all in all. And so, therefore, as the Bhagavatam itself asks, what need is there of any other scripture than this own Srimad Bhagavatam? Mm. So, in explaining this, uh, this point, Dharma Prochikata Aitta Bhatra, uh, and Srila Sridhar Maharaj's commentary, Srila Prabhupada spoke of five stages of knowledge uh, Pratyaksha, Paroksha, Aparoksha, Arhoksaja, and Aprakrita. And this is very relevant also in understanding the importance of Srimad Bhagavatam. So, Pratyaksha Jnana means the knowledge we obtain through our senses. When we look at the world around us, what we hear, what we taste, what we smell. This is giving us knowledge, but it is the lowest standard of knowledge called pratyaksha. It, it, this is clearly material knowledge. Then beyond that there is uh, paroksha knowledge. So paroksha knowledge is as Prabhupada explained, hearing from authorities in the unrealized state. <clears throat> we, we have no knowledge of anything beyond what our senses tell us. And we're hearing from Srila Prabhupada, we're hearing from Srila Prabhupada's representatives uh, about the spiritual world, about so many wonderful, of course, very wonderful topics. But directly, we don't have perception of them. But if one hears with faith uh, and goes on hearing, this is called paroksha, paroksha vyam. And Prabhupada gave a nice example. He said, just like if you have a friend who lives thousands and thousands of miles away in another country, perhaps the other, another hemisphere of the world, and if you talk to such a friend on the telephone, then uh, it's like if you call someone in, in India, uh, then very often uh, you call him at a convenient time for him, but you, for you it's late at night, you see. For you it may be in the middle of the night. And he answers, and you say, how are things there? And he says, oh, the sun is brilliant today, it's a very bright sunny day. When you look out the window, it's, it's dark. But through his description, you're, you're also able to appreciate that, oh, you're enjoying a very nice day there. That's, that's nice. Good. So Prabhupada gave this example for paroksha gyan. And then aparoksha. Aparoksha means we begin to get some realization. Uh, and and uh, this is not necessarily, we're not yet needing to talk about transnational realization. Because actually this, this paroksha, uh, I'm sorry, aparoksha as explained by Prabhupada does not correspond really to transcendental realization which comes later. But uh, it is just like when you're uh, learning a lesson in school, <coughs> um, learning arithmetic or something, uh, uh, multiplication, you see, you're learning that, that uh, symbol x means times, so 2 times 2 equals 4. 6 times 2 equals 12. So, when, for, you know, you all remember when you first were confronted with that in school, it was, <laughs> you see, these strange symbols and, and you, you, you couldn't grasp how it works immediately. But if you study and you practice, then you catch on. You catch on, you, you, it, it clicks finally, oh, this is how it works. 
And then you can do these uh, multiplication tables yourself. It's not a problem anymore. You see, you see the sensor. So this, this, this is also a real a stage of realization. You see, when you grasp the lesson and you can uh, work with this knowledge, which before was very baffling to you, but now you've mastered it and you can work with it. <coughs> so this is Aparoksha. And then Adhoksaja, which Srila Prabhupada explained, means knowledge beyond the senses. So this is the fourth stage of knowledge, and this corresponds to liberation. And Adhoksaja, Adhoksaja that we find in the Srimad Bhagavatam, is specifically the name of Paramatma. We find a verse, for example, where Sri Pallad Maharaj is, a, is speaking of the Paramatma, naming him as Adhoksaja. So Adhoksaja means he who is beyond Aksaja, the knowledge of the senses. You see, the Paramatma is here with us in this body, in our heart, but we cannot see him, although he's in the self same body that we reside in, but we can't see him. Doctors, they x-ray the chest, but they don't see formed Vishnu there, <laughs> because he is Adhoksaja, he is uh, above, beyond the senses, the mind. But he can be realized, he can be seen uh, by his spiritual process. And one who realizes Lord and Hoksaja in the heart, that person is liberated. But this knowledge develops in five stages. There is yet a fifth stage, and that is called Aprakrita, which means non-material, entirely it has no association, even Adhoksija as, as Paramatma, that means that the material energy is below him, under his control. He is the Ishwara, he is the controller of it. So there's still some association. Because after all, uh, Paramatma, he's Purusha Avatar, he has entered into this material nature for the purpose of creation. But Aprakrita means entirely disassociated with this material nature. This means the spiritual nature, the transcendental nature. This means the Leela of the Lord in His own abode. So this is Aprakrita. And so the Srimad Bhagavatam is uh, bringing us up. You see, uh, uh, we will talk in a moment about the, the uh, ten subject matters of Srimad Bhagavatam. So the first is Sarga or creation. This is the first subject matter of Bhagavatam. Now it's creation. What is creation? Creation is something we see with our senses. Not entirely, of course, but <clears throat> the discussion of creation, the, its reference is within our sensual, sensory possibilities to some extent. Uh, when we're hearing about the creation of the sun and the moon, well, we know what the sun and the moon are. We, we are at least we have some idea of that from our perception. So, Sarga, creation, <coughs> the, the topic of creation there is beginning down at the Pratyaksha level. This is how you, you bring uh, hearers into the uh, Bhagavad Kata. You tell them about where this world has come from that they're living in. You see? And, but, Bhagavatam does not stop there. Some scriptures stop there. That, that's that's the. I mean, basically speaking, the Bible is. That's the extent of the of the knowledge that the Bible has to teach. God said, "Let there be light," and there was light. God created the heaven and the earth in seven days, and then He rested. And that's all we know about Him. <laughs> that's basically all we know about that God is that He did this work of creation in seven days, and sometimes after that He appeared as a burning bush or whatever, this or that few things, other things he did. But all in reference to the material world, you see. But Bhagavatam doesn't stop there. And Bhagavatam is bringing us through all these stages and the summum bonum, as we will hear when we come to the uh, ten subjects matters, the, the, the supreme good, the supreme value, valuable teaching of the Srimad Bhagavatam 
is the you know, nitya lila of Lord Krishna in the spiritual world, which is, which is, you know, has nothing to do with the shristi sthiti pralaya creation maintenance instruction of this material world. So this is uh, this what I've just told you now. This is coming from Srila Prabhupada, from his own explanation of this Dharma Projita Kaitava Atra statement of the Bhagavatam. And so moving on, this verse 2 uh, makes several more very, very significant points. Parvo Nyamat Sanan Satam. What does that mean? Very important. Yes? Maharaj, it's meant for Paramahamsas and or those who are not envious. Those who are not envious. Yes. Matsharanam Satam. Satam means devotee. Mm -hmm. Paramo means they're on the most exalted platform of spiritual life, and that is pure devotee of the Lord. There is no one who, who uh, outside of devotional service, can come to this uh, param platform of transcendence, supreme platform of transcendental consciousness. And nirmat sanam means their heart is free from envy. Now, the significance of this is that in order to be to enter into the pastimes of Lord Krishna, to relish them, one cannot have any envy because our, our disease, our primordial disease is this enviousness. Often I, I, I'm saying how uh, we find in the uh, uh, song of Narottam Das Thakur, uh, Prema Bhakti Chandrika, this deha bhai shayi ritpu gana jatte ka indriya gana keha kara bhai nahi hoi aap shuni leila shuna kan jani leila jana prav dharje na pari nishchaya kama seva krishna seva kama seva krishna kamar pani krodha bhakti desi jani loba sadhu sakva hari kata ishtu lava dene madha krishna guna nama nijukta khari vajra tatata so he's explaining how by devotional service one can overcome the enemies, Ritpu, uh, uh, <coughs> the enemies of spiritual advancement, which are what? Kam, Krod, Lo, uh, Lust, Anger, Greed, Mada, Madness, Moha, Illusion, and Matsarya, Enviousness. And how they are to be overcome, he explains. He explains how, one by one, they can be engaged. Uh, Kama Krishna Seva Kamarpani. You desire very strongly, come uh, to serve Krishna. Kruda Bhakti Visijani. And you can become angry against those who are uh, uh, Bhakti Visha, those who are enemies of the devotees. So each one, he says, how it can be engaged in Krishna's service. But the list stops at five. <laughs> there are six enemies, but the list doesn't go beyond five. <laughs> that means one is left off. Enviousness. That means envy, there's no place for envy at all. Enviousness simply must be rejected entirely. You can't engage it, you can't do anything with it. It must be stopped. Completely thrown out of the heart. Because why? Because that's the uh, that's the original disease of the living entity. We are envious of Krishna and envious of Krishna's devotees. And so, one who is envious, they will not be able to develop this rasa, this taste for hearing about Krishna's pastimes. They'll or they'll hear it in the wrong way, like the sahajyas, prakriti sahajyas. This is, they have this Bhagavad Saptaha in India where someone is coming to a town and speaking on Srimad Bhagavatam, but it means only 10th canto. 10th canto about Krishna's Rajalila with the gopis. 
And he speaks on this for 10 days, citing the verses and explaining them. And it is a kind of theater, you see. He is uh, speaking in a dramatic way and the audience is responding as if it is a kind of theater show. And nobody is getting the real point. The speaker is not able to give the real point that uh, Krishna's Nitya Lila is transcendental, is above lust, anger, greed, etc. Unfor and they're so unfortunate, they're thinking that this is just some kind of lusty experience that is being described. Some kind of idealized romance, you see, like, okay, there was Radha and Krishna, there was Romeo and Julia, there was <laughs> the great lovers of history. <laughs> and this is extremely obnoxious. This spoils, this spoils our entrance into Srimad Bhagavatam. So therefore, Nyamat Saranam, this is stressed. Uh, this Bhagavatam, the dis particular description of Krishna's pastimes, is meant for those who are not envious. So, now if we do have that problem, still in our heart, then that means we have to take shelter of those who are not envious. We have to hear from those who are not envious. So that this will be cleansed away. Then, Bedyam Bastavam Atra Bastu Shivanam Chapatraya Mulanam. <coughs> so, Vedyam Bastavam Atra Bastu Shivanam. Bastu, everybody's heard this word Bastu. Everyone's interested asking questions. Tell us about Bastu. But in, the Bhagavatam talks about Bastu, but it doesn't mean putting, uh, you know, pots of water in the eastern corner or something like that. <laughs> Bastu means substance. So, the Bhagavatam is about the substance of the Veda. Uh, uh, Vedyam Bastavam, Atra Bastu, Shivaram. And this substance is Shivaram, it is all auspicious. Just like that book I titled Substance and Shadow. So, substance means the actual stuff of reality. Uh, the actual tangible stuff of reality, and shadow means the illusory reflection uh, of that. So that is Maya. And the actual substance is what? Is Krishna. This is the declaration of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, the Vastu is nothing other than the Supreme Lord Himself. He is the substance of everything. The essence of reality itself. Uh, so tapatrayam mulanam means that uh, so if we become educated in this uh, vastu, in this topic of the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is none other than Sri Krishna, then that will uproot from within our hearts the threefold miseries. Our suffering will come to an end. So uh, this, we can see in this uh, second verse, there is a prescriptive message being given. Uh, they, they, it is declared that this uh, Bhagavatam is meant for the Paramahamsas, but also for everyone else too. The Paramahamsas, as we'll hear in the third verse, they're, they're able to relish the Bhagavatam. They're actually able to relish the Bhagavatam. Uh, but others, we have to take the Bhagavatam as, as a medicine. Tapa Jaya Mulanam. This will uproot our miseries, just like a medicine is. We take a medicine and it's rooting out the, the disease, which is the uh, cause of our suffering. So therefore the second verse is asking, Kim Ba Para, what, what need is there of any other Shastra? There is no other scripture that is going to give you what the Sriman Bhagavatam gives. So there's no need to, uh, you know, to first of all, um, Orient yourself on the subject of, you know, the subject matter of Bhagavatam by uh, going through 100 Nagu Upanishads, studying them very carefully, and then coming to Vedanta Sutra and pondering the sutras and reading the Bhasyas and the and different Acharyas 
and then finally coming to the shri. There's no need for that. You just take Bhagavatam. Then, Ishwara Sadhya Hridi Avrudyate. Yes, this is another important point. Sadhya means at once. Ishwara Sadhya Hridi Avrudyate. If we take to this cure of the Srimad Bhagavatam, if we take it as it is meant to, to be taken by us, then sadhya means at once, very, very quickly. And then the Supreme Lord, uh, Ishwara, Krishna, Ishwara Parama Krishna, will become established in our hearts. That's the meaning of this last line, Ishwara Sodhya Khridi Avarudyati. So this is how the Bhagavatam is meant for everyone, not of course, the Paramahamsas is meant for them because they know how to relish it. Uh, as long as our hearts are afflicted by enviousness, we can't relish it, but we take it as a cure. So verse 3 then is speaking about uh, the appreciation of Bhagavatam by the Paramahamsas. Nigama kalpa turor galitam palam. Each one of these lines is so important. Nigama kalpa. Who can explain what that means? Nigama Kalpa. Yes? Well, you're jumping ahead. I just want to know what Nigama Kalpa means. Kalpa means desire. Is it desire? Yes. And Nigama? Nigama means the Vedic literatures. So this verse is comparing the entire body of Vedic scriptures, Nigama, actually we can explain, there's Nigama, which are the uh, uh, formal Vedic Shastras, and then there's Agama, like the Pantratric literatures. They're not exactly categorized as Vedic literature, they are, they are a commentary, they are a devotional commentary upon the Vedic scriptures made by uh, the great sage Narada Muni. That's called Agama, that which comes down, comes down by way of tradition. And Nigama means the formal Vedic scriptures uh, taught uh, traditionally uh, in the Parampara, uh, 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 copied out and approved by great saints and sages. These are the Vedic texts which originate with Lord Brahma. So Nigama Kalpa. So the Nigama Kalpa Taru, actually. So Kalpa Taru. Uh, the, uh, this formal body of Vedic literatures is compared to a, a tree, a desire tree, in fact. And Galitam Palam, so Palam means fruit. Galitam means fully ripened. So the Srimad Bhagavatam is the, uh, think, think of the tree as a mango tree. And there is one very wonderful looking, wonderfully smelling mango hanging from that tree. And bees are buzzing around it. <laughs> and birds are gathering to sing its glories. <laughs> this is the Srimad Bhagavatam. And something wonderful has happened. Ashuka Mukha Amrita Drava Samyutam. That this, this uh, mango has been touched by the mukha, means the beak of a parrot, Shuka. This is Shuka Deva Goswami. And so, because he has touched this fruit first of all, and therefore it has become even more sweet. This is a, uh, something that is believed in India. Put it this way. This is a this is a traditional belief in India that mango is sweet, but if a parrot happens to have picked it, then it becomes even more sweet by the touch of the parrot's mouth. So Bhagavatam is sweet, but because Shukadeva Goswami was the first one to recite it, therefore it has become so much 
more sweeter. Omrita nectar dravya samyutam, just full of juice. So therefore, pibata bhagavatam, uh, rasam alayam. So pibata means to drink. Uh, oh great sages, bhuvi uh, babuka. Babuka means uh, babuka means Prabhupada is translated as a greatly learned person, but. Bhava, the word Bhava in this Bhavuka, Bhava, also means one whose spiritual emotions are fully aroused. So this, this means that a uh, transcendentalist devotee of the Lord, who is uh, uh, knowledgeable in all in the meanings of all scriptures, but also whose love of Godhead is aroused. So Pibata, he Pibata Bhagavatam, he will drink this Bhagavatam like nectar. Rasam alayam. It is full of rasa. <coughs> the Bhagavatam is, is giving us a taste of this rasa, the, the, the uh, uh, mellows of loving relationship with Krishna. Rasam alayam, and Prabhupada has translated this alayam to mean even after liberation which is referring back to the previous verses statement, as I already explained to you, dharma uh, projika uh, that uh, those dharmas which only go up to liberation are rejected. This tasting of Srimad Bhagavatam goes on even after liberation. It takes us beyond liberation. Uh, so, muhur ho rasika bhuvi babu kaha. So this Bhagavatam is meant for those who are rasik. You see, those who are rasik, those who have uh, the adhikar, the, the qualification to be able to taste the mellows of love of God in, then they find uh, the unlimited storehouse of nectar in the narratives of this great book. So we have now uh, covered, I think, the important points that I wanted to mention from the first three verses of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Why Srimad Bhagavatam is the most outstanding scripture. And let's hear some more from later verses. Verses, and this is just in summary, verses 4 through 8 in the same first chapter, first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. And, uh, instruct us to hear the Srimad Bhagavatam from a bona fide representative of Srimad Vyasati. Verses 9 to 13 teach us that if the speaker and the hearer are qualified, then the hearer will very easily be able to understand Krishna. Verses 14 through 20 tell us that hearing about Krishna frees us from this abominable trap that is set for the living entities in this Kali Yuga by the personality of Kali. You can see in this modern culture how people are sucked down, uh, being sucked down to hell by the most abominable kinds of addictions and obsessions and bad habits and so on and so forth. Sinful activities, which they cannot give up. They simply, or they may give up one, but then they take to another, you see. They're just simply trapped in a net of sinful activities. But Bhagavatam says, if we hear this, uh, the nectar of Krishna Kata, from this great book, Bhagavad Purana, then we will be able to get free of Kali's trap. Now we want to move on to the six questions the Srimad Bhagavatam unfolds from six questions that are put by the sages of Naimishwanya to Sri Sutta Goswami. And this is all in the first uh, chapter of the first canto. So the first question is enunciated in uh, chapter 1, text number 9. And this question is, what is the ultimate benefit for mankind? The answer to this question is found in Canto 1, Chapter 2, verses 6 through 7, and also in following verses up to about verse 27. 
And <clears throat> here we find the answer to the question, what is the ultimate benefit for mankind to be? That mankind should become free from material bondage and develop love of Godhead through the process of devotional service. Then, Canto 1, Chapter 1, Verse 11 asks, what is the essence of all scriptures? This is answered in Canto 1, Chapter 2, Verses 6 through 7 again, and also the following verses up to about verse 28. Here it is explained that Krishna is the only object of worship. We should establish our relationship with him in love and serve him in love. So, actually, in this, uh, in, the, in the course of these verses, what is being revealed in this answer, verse by verse, uh, are Samanda, Avidya, and Prayojana, which Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has said is the only subject matter of all the Vedic scriptures, but of course, particularly of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Sambandha means uh, the connection to Krishna. Krishna is the only object of worship. Abhidya means the functional relationship. We should establish our relationship with Krishna in love and serve Him in love. Prayojana means love of Godhead. The function of love of Godhead is devotional service. The third question, Canto 1, Chapter 1, Verse 12, why did Lord Krishna appear in this world? The answer is in uh, the second chapter of Canto 1, verse number 34. He appeared to reclaim those who are in the mode of pure goodness. Those who have come to the Vasudeva Sattva platform by execution of devotional service, uh, Krishna had, he particularly came to reclaim them, bring them back home, back to Godhead. Question number four, Canto 1, Chapter 1, Text 17. What are the Lord's acts of creation? Answer, Canto 1, Chapter 2, verses 30 through 33. That Vasudeva is the source of the material substance, and he personally enters into that substance as the Purusha avatars. Of course, that means Mahavishnu, Gavadaksha Vishnu, Chiraksha Vishnu, or Super Soul. And also, this is further explained, this question is answered in great detail in Cantos 3 and 4. Then the fifth question, Canto 1, Chapter 1, Text 18, please describe the activities of the incarnations of the Lord. So, the activities of the incarnations of the Lord are summarized in 1st Canto, Chapter 3, 